as you know, born Peter Roger Casement Brady. Rory O'Broad was born on the 2nd of October 1932. He was an Irish Republican paramilitary and political leader, Chief of Staff of the IRA from 1958 to 59, involved in the border campaign, and again, Chief of Staff 60 to 62, President of Sinn Féin from 70 to 83, and President of Republican Sinn Féin from 1987 until 2009. And as you are aware, he passed away on the 5th of June 2013. Well, as a result of that, the result of pa- passing of such a, a figure in Irish politics, I caught up with the current President of Republican Sinn Féin, Des Dalton, to talk about Rory O'Brothig's legacy. Uh, so we discussed that, we discussed a number of things. We discussed the proposal of Era Nua that Rory O'Brothig put forward for as the title was suggested, New Ireland, the New Ireland that was to be broken into four and was to be a very inclusive project. Uh, we met and discussed also as well the faecal talks, the attitude of the Irish government, the government of the 26 counties towards those talks, which might surprise people how unsupportive they were towards it, all of which was released in, um, in state papers that were released seven years ago, the reluctance of the government of the 26 counties for a United Ireland we discussed that. We discussed the split in the Sinn Féin's in the 80s and 86, essentially when the current Sinn Féin decided to take up their seats in the Dáil, which Republican Sinn Féin could not be a part of. Uh, we discussed as well the what was much discussed and shown in the media of late was Rory O'Brothig's funeral in the west of Ireland and the heavy Garda presence at that funeral. Not just were Garda there to police traffic, as you would expect for a, a crowd of over a thousand people. Uh, they were also there in full riot gear, full combat gear, and um, there were quite a number of scenes of jostling and pushing and, and all sorts of things going on at the graveyard in full view of families and children and so on and so forth. So not really the type of scene you'd expect to see at a funeral, regardless of your opinion of somebody's political opinion. Okay, so as I said, I caught up with Des Dalton last weekend to discuss these issues and indeed the legacy of Rory O'Brothig. A relevance of his legacy would be that, in fact, far from being one of the last Irish Republicans, I think it's because of his work and because of the the level of commitment which which he gave, really right, almost right up to his death, he's ensured that there has been a continuity of a generation um, that there is a new generation succeeding him in terms of adherence to that, that same Irish republicanism. Um, in, in terms of his career and looking at his lasting you know, uh, achievements, I suppose the outstanding one really would be, along with the late Ahia O'Connell, was the, formation, the formulation of the Eranua programme, um, which, was the, which is and remains the policy of Republican Champagne today, the idea of a, a four-province federation of Ireland. And that was a very significant step forward, particularly with its um, proposals for a nine-county Dáil an Ulster Parliament. And that was addressing, with its provisions for local majorities and so on, that was addressing in, 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 in a serious way the, the concerns of the unionist stroke loyalist community. And indeed, throughout the 1970s, Rory Brody engaged in very serious dialogue with representatives of the Protestant churches, um, with the representatives of Lila's groups and so on. The faecal talks, I suppose, were an outstanding example of that, but yeah. he was also closely involved in the uh, the, the, the Bowen McBride talks in the late 1970s. So, you know, I think from that point of view and that outreach, and that was acknowledged very much by, by representatives of Lyleism and, and indeed in about four or five years ago he met with some uh, representatives of the Prentice Boys, for instance, in Derry and they acknowledged you know, that Aaron Noah was, was a serious attempt, probably the only significant attempt by republicanism struck nationalism to mm. paint what a united Ireland would mean to the Protestant uh, minority within Ireland and what where their place was in that. So I, I, I think from that point of view that's a very significant legacy and a very significant achievement. Yeah, now you mentioned Erinu and the talks at Fecal. Mm-hmm. Why do you believe they collapsed? I think there's a number of elements there. I think particularly, and, 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 and this is part of the dynamic, if you like, of partition, that the political establishment here in this state, the 26 county state, Definitely, you know, I think, it, and, and, and this has emerged in some of the state papers which have, uh, have, have come out over the last four to five years, definitely they had uh, a motive, if you like, to contain what was happening within the six counties, within the six counties. They feared the destabilisation of their own state here. Um, I mean, the McBride Bowl talks were, were scuppered really by the actions of Conor Cruz O'Brien, who actually exposed them publicly uh, in an interview on RT Radio. And... Uh, what were his, you know, talks which could possibly have led and averted 
serious you know loss of life in the 1980s and so on were brought you know really brought to an end by the actions the irresponsible actions of of, of, of government ministers the, the fecal talks were, 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 were scuppered by the actions again of the of the, of the forces of the 96 counties mm. um, I think definitely yes there was an agenda there to ensure that there wasn't a fundamental radical settlement um, anything close to a British withdrawal uh, because of the fear of destabilising the state. I think the realisation was there that if there was that kind of radical settlement, the dynamic, the political dynamic that would be created, I think would, would throw a spotlight on the need for change here, radical change here. And in, in fact, like Gareth Fitzgerald, for instance, in, in 1975, met with Jim Callaghan, the, the then British Prime Minister, because at that stage the British government was at least moving seriously the idea of withdrawal from, from, from six counties and Gareth Fitzgerald put it to him quite forcefully that from a Dublin government point of view that was something that they could not consider really? and could not be on the table. The idea of a united Ireland wasn't simply attacking on of the six mm. counties to the present state. You know, Republicans would actually would say to unions when they would complain about the failings of the state. Yeah. Republicans would say, we take the same boxes, we have the same issues, you know. So we were actually trying to break out of this state as well. Yeah. And what we're talking about is a new Ireland, you know, where everything is on the table. Everybody then is involved in negotiating what that shape that new Ireland will be. Mm. That's the whole, if you like, the whole rationale of it, I know. Far from being the, the hardliner, uh, quite inclusive, trying to include... Uh, including unionists and Protestants in the New Ireland, the Aranua, and very much open to peace talks as well. So it's not the, the image that we often see in the mainstream media. Mm-hmm. So with all that in mind, and with the, the New Ireland that, that Rory wanted to build, uh, how was it exactly that the split came about between the, the two Sinn Féins in 1986? Well, again, um, you know, the, 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 the causes and so on are, are, are probably quite historical in the sense that you know, this is a, a trend within the Republican movement, probably going back to the, to, to 1921. That That's it. it came down to the issue of the recognition of, of, of this state and recognition of the structures of partition, which, from a Republican perspective, and one that Roy Abadi advocated throughout his life, would be that once you accepted that fundamental, once you accepted that paradigm, really the logical position then was that you you, you 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 fully accepted the constitution and all of that, all of its implications. So, for him, it was quite logical where this process would ultimately lead and you know I think his analysis that of Di O'Connell was borne out by the facts in subsequent years I suppose there was two elements to that in the early 80s and again this somewhat goes back to what we were talking about in terms of Eridu and that idea of an inclusive Ireland um, the first as it really is a device to, to kind of isolate and remove a body um, that particular element of the leadership um, that led the, the, the move towards entering Leinster House um, identified Aaron Nua um, as obviously quite very closely identified with Rory Brody described it as a sop to loyalism, described it as something which was not acceptable from a Republican perspective from there, you know, as they, they couched it, yeah. uh, removed that. O'Brady felt so strongly about it, not not just in terms of his own position within Sinn Féin, but, uh, and he made this clear recently, as I say, speaking to, to um, some representatives of, of, of light orders in, 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 in the North, that he felt that by removing Aranua, he felt even as a Republican leader, it removed his ability to speak in a meaningful way to all sections of the Irish people. So himself and Rory and Dahi O'Connell stepped down from their positions of president and vice president respectively in 1983. Then 1986 came down on that fundamental question and at that hard ash, you know, Rory Brody spent out clearly that, you know, this wasn't merely a tactic. This was this is this was a principle. It was a fundamental principle. It, it, it basically dictated the future direction of the Republican movement in a fundamental way. Um, so you know the, the, that, that and Ed Maloney charts it quite quite well in his book, um, the Secret History of the IRA, the process that 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 went on there, it, it didn't just emerge in 1986, it had been a process that probably had begun in the mid-1970s, but ultimately um, you know, Rory Roddy's position was defeated in Ardesh from his and our perspective he walked out of that Ardesh along with, with, with um, I think there was something like uh, close to 100 delegates and um, you know, many more supporters from a Republican perspective, reconvened the Irish at the West County Hotel, reorganised under the banner of Republican Sinn Féin and mm. continued his work there. But yes, it was, it was on quite a fundamental point of principle. And, and, and on that question, um, it's, uh, Rory actually told me the story himself. A journalist some years ago travelled down to Roscommon to interview him. And 
the first thing he said to me is that I've come to talk to you because you seem to be able to predict the various crises and so on in the process and where they're coming and Rory laughed and he said well you know I'm not a fortune teller I'm not a soothsayer he said and he pointed to his bookshelves and he said it's, it's there yeah. for anybody it's not a mystery he said you know there's, there are certain forces tendencies and trends in history and if you read those and study those you'll, you, you'll, you'll foretell where these things go certain actions lead to certain consequences and you know one of the actions would be recognition of the state and it, it, it has a, it has its own logic you know I mean it, the logic is you recognise the state and we can see that now to the point where provisions Sinn Féin are now sitting not only in Leinster House, but are now holding British government ministry positions in the north and have moved to a position that no previous yeah. group who would style themselves Republican have done. They're actually yeah. administering and policing British rule in the north. Yes. So, you know, I, I, from that point of view, that analysis turned out to be quite accurate. Now, some people might say that what they're doing is a step in the direction towards achieving a united Ireland. And while they might be taking holding British ministerial mm. cabinet positions, that's a, it, it's a necessary... If you, from a Republican point of view, it's a necessary evil that they have to go through in order to achieve a full United Ireland. What do you think of that? Well, again, I suppose we're back to the stepping stones argument, yeah. and it's as old as <laughs> yeah, almost as old as the movement itself. Yes, I mean that argument certainly has been trotted out, um, not just by Jerry Adams, but as I say, by others in the past. I, I think we have to judge that on, on, on what's actually happening on the ground yeah. and, and, and what we see before us, and actually. You know, we, we we held an anti-imperialist forum over the weekend, and there was one of the contributors there actually made a, a, an interesting point that Terence O'Neill in in, in in 1965 and in, in his famous address about Ulster being at a crossroads, and he talked about you know if you treat a Catholic the same as a Protestant, if you give them good jobs and housing and so on, maybe they'll begin behaving like Protestants. And what he was saying was, you know, you treat these people well, you you you, you make them feel at home here. They, they, they'll accept the state. They, they, they'll become part of the state, and you know right. nothing changes. And really, the project of the '98 agreement has been about reforming the northern state. It's about making it more acceptable to live under, and so on. And obviously, from a Republican perspective, this is not about um, making English rule or British rule easier to live under. I mean, we're, we're, we're back to tone here. It's about breaking the connection with England. Um, what we're seeing at the moment, and you can see it in some of the polls. You know this this sectarian headcount idea that in, 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 you know and it's one that the provisionals put forward, which is completely anti-republican, really. This idea of almost outbreeding the Protestants, which is right. you know it, it, its rationale is is completely skewed, and it's, it's actually quite dangerous as well. It's, you know because it's kind of forcing the unionist Protestant community kind of into a corner as well, and making them feel even more besieged. Yeah. But also. It, it works on a, on a logic which, to me, is quite illogical. That automatically all of these Catholics will be nationalist Republican. That that doesn't necessarily follow. I mean, you have a new generation growing up in what is deemed a normal society and so on. So they, you know, they they they, they see a state which, from their point of view, may well be working, whatever. And it becomes an end in itself. You know. So from a Republican perspective, it's certainly not a revolutionary position. It's certainly one, not one. What it does is actually just further re entrenches mm. the existing state. I mean, by going in there, they're making the state or attempting to make the state work. Yeah. That's certainly not a revolutionary position. I mean, they're publishing budgetary proposals for the next 15 to 20 years and so on. That's not the actions of a revolutionary organisation. And, you know, the reality on the ground, and, you know, this emerged at the weekend as well, talking to people there, and there was some spokespeople there, for, say, from communities in the Ardine and the George mm -hmm. Rand. There's a grim reality there still for nationalist communities where the relationship with the RUC, PSNI, hasn't fundamentally changed. You know, there's still political prisoners there, there's still a level of repression on the ground, there's sectarianism, the sectarian divide has increased, you know, and that was one of the things we warned about, and Rory Abradi warned about, in terms of the Belfast Agreement in 98, that it institutionalised sectarianism. You know, I mean, people, political parties, even in Stormont, have to designate themselves as nationalist or unionist. So even at that level, you know, there's been an increase in peace walls, there's there's a further polarisation, because if you like, the big issues have been removed now, the big constitutional questions have been taken off the table, and what you have now are two sectarian power blocks at the centre of it, you have the DUP on one side, mm -hmm. and you have Provisional Sinn Féin on the other, and both play to their constituencies. Mm -hmm. That's the real politique of it, they need to, at times, play that sectarian card, and again, all of that leads to an abnormal society, and it's it, it, it's quite evident. So certainly no, uh, the, the, the logic or the rationale of the stepping stones 
doesn't doesn't isn't borne out by the facts. Doesn't apply because no people are getting uh, they're getting used to a certain amount of comfort if you like they're getting used to the state being what it is and he said they're proposing 15 and 20 year plans for that state so it doesn't really look like they want to change it too much no no yeah. I, I don't think so and you know even even the rationale of someone in Mark McGuinness's position you know how can he come out and say well you know I'm the deputy first minister of a state of which I want to fundamentally I, I, I want to bring down yeah. you know it, 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 it just doesn't apply you know yeah it doesn't, it doesn't make much sense mm. Um, now, just to talk as well recently about the Rory's funeral and the presence of riot police. The guards were there in full riot, combat gear, uh, shields, helmets, batons. Uh, what was what brought about their presence at the funeral? Uh, I think it was a strong political statement. I think by the by the by the by the present twenty six county government. Um, you know, again, this one is as old as the hills. I mean, Republicans are used to this kind of repression at funerals, and you can read the accounts of going back as far as the 1940s and beyond yeah. to that. So, so there was no s- but, uh, sign of any trouble that would have re- um, that would have called for their presence being there. None whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was quite a very traditional West of Ireland funeral, a traditional Irish funeral in many respects. Um, Republican funeral, absolutely yes. I mean, there was a colour party, there was a guard of honour there, men in white shirts and black ties. A lot of children, a lot of you know people from. I mean, Rory Roddy, regardless of his political Republican politics, was a person who was highly respected across broad spectrums of Irish society, and that was reflected by the, the attendance at his funeral. And um, certainly not in terms of the the, the open, open display and carrying of weapons, and particularly in church grounds and in the graveyard, was shocking to a lot of people there. And I know that there was a number of pol- local politicians uh, Sorry, present. Fine, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil yes. politicians attended the funeral. Oh, absolutely, yes. And 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 uh, I know members of the family put it to them, you know, and 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 pointed out to them this display of of, of, of state aggression. It was state aggression. I mean, the people who brought weapons onto the streets of an Irish town were the state themselves mm. and brought open displays of violence. And the display, you know, I pointed it out at the graveside that it was probably the most heavily policed funeral probably in the west of Ireland since the funeral of the hunger striker Frank Stagg in the 1970s, mm. obviously on a smaller scale. But, you know, I mean, right police in a... In a, in a, in a in, Church of Ireland graveyard in Roscommon, you know, I mean, I, th- I think it really shocked people and it was highly provocative. I mean, when we arrived in the, in the, in the graveyard, there was something like 14 uniformed guardy ringing the grave. Now, that in itself elicited a strong reaction from the people who were there. I mean, Rory Brody had 15 grandchildren were present there. There were a lot of small children and so on. And there were shocking scenes in the graveyard. And certainly, in fairness to the crowd, the crowd were very restrained. I mean, the, the actions of the crowd were simply to just push the guardy back to allow the family to come in around the grave and to create a space there within which the, the priest could, you know, um, officiate over the, the, the formal religious ceremony and the, the, the formal ceremony could take place. But it was certainly, yes, it was... I, I think in many ways it probably exposed... Um, you know, despite all the talk of, you know, that we've moved the hunt and, you know, the, the, all of these various slogans that we hear and uh, cliches, but, you know, in many ways, uh, you know, the more things change, the more they say the same. And that, that, that visceral reaction of the state to uh, Republicans and Republicanism is still there. I, I noticed there was a tweet by, by uh, I think it was a freelance journalist, his name escapes me, but he, he, he said that the scenes at the grave sickened him, because, or saddened him rather, because he said, you know, civil war politics isn't dead. You know, yeah. that, that, that state reaction is still there. Yeah. So I think from Rory O'Brody's perspective, <coughs> in some ways it was kind of an inverse compliment, and he'd probably take it, and I point said it at the <laughs> graveside, that in life they feared him, and, you know, like similarly in death, his yeah. spirit is still feared. And can, can you tell me something about the behaviour of the guards? Were they, were they trying to jostle people or intimidate them in any way? Yes, very much so, and quite intimidatory. And I, I, you know, on the on the Saturday evening, or sorry, on the Friday evening, at the removal, I know his son Croher and his eldest son Matt actually, went, you know, made a point of speaking to the local superintendent outside the church, complaining about the fact that their eighty-one-year-old mother had to walk through a gauntlet of these armed guardy and so on, and their family, and how unnecessary it was, mm. and indeed questioned the legality of them even being on church ground. Um, and got a very, you know, uh, uh, and they actually said it to me at the time that they knew by the reaction they got, he, he, he was just kind of giving out a state line. There was no kind of human interaction at all at that mm-hmm. level. Um, so it was very pointed. And in the graveyard, 
very, very aggressive, you know. And I, I, I myself, for instance, you know, on, on occasion, they, they, they attempted like even to blank myself, and I, I, I was just simply asking, them, would you please move back? You know, please move back from the graveside. You know, we, you know, this, this is a ceremony we want to, we want to hold with dignity and with respect and in peace. And um, there was no attempt to kind of interact with people at all, uh, and even on that basic level. I mean, we've had occasions in the past where we would deal with Gardy in terms of holding a ceremony and, and you know you can you can you can work out <laughs> establish some kind of rapport in the sense of facilitating movement and so on but that, that certainly wasn't there on the day and do you have any idea who gave the order for them to be there i don't mean a name sure, but no. I mean, an authority or an institution well uh, you know I, I i i would certainly feel that that such a show of force certainly would require authorization at a very very senior level and i could see a very senior political level i would think and i think i i would certainly would feel that this present government not unlike many of its predecessors and particularly many predecessors of a similar political hue mm. uh, have done likewise and have used ironically they've accused republicans of politicising funerals and yeah. in many cases they're the people who have highly politicised funerals and I think that's really what they did with Rory Abroad I think they were making a political statement about republicanism and its place in society mm. and their, uh, by their actions at the funeral of Rory Abroad OK so now today where is Republican Sinn Féin and the idea of a 32-county United Ireland? Where, where is that and what is Republican Sinn Féin doing to achieve it? Uh, f- I suppose there are two parts there, yeah. Well, I suppose in the first part, um, you know, as I said, this weekend we've just held a very successful anti-imperialist forum in, in Belfast where we interacted with a broad range of groups and organisations and indeed groups such as Shell the Sea, uh, the, New- the Peace and Neutrality Alliance, um, some trade union activists and so on talking about the issues that are out there at the moment um, you know we're, we're in a state of huge to say the least political flux and crisis um, you know I think both states are, are, are quite unstable I mean you know we talked about the, if you like the new the twin imperialisms that Ireland are, are received by now I mean historically and still to this day in the six counties we have the old imperialism of the very obvious imperialism of British occupation political and military and so on but now in this part of Ireland we're, we're, we're seeing the effects of the, of the new imperialism the economic and social imperialism of, of the EU and the ECB the IMF trike and so on so I suppose firstly they're the challenges they're the enemy if you like that, 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 that we're faced with we would see it from our perspective, from where Republican Sinn Féin fits into all of that, is where we're coming to the table um, with a set of proposals in Era Nua, um, Sale Nua, Social Economic Programme. We're coming to with, a, with something which we believe that the Irish people are looking for, which is something new, something fresh, an alternative way forward, a new Ireland. Um, I think the polls that we see recently, the, 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 the opinion polls, particularly in this state, you know, you see the one of the one demographic that's definitely growing is the don't knows, the people who are kind of saying a plague in all your houses, which is really in many ways um, a statement of disconnect with the political class in Leinster House, not just even in government, but even those in opposition. And we see there a vacuum that w- which can be filled, and I think, you know, Republicanism and, 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 and revolutionary republicanism I think has a place there to fill that gap and we would see that as our role um, in terms of working towards a, a united Ireland um, certainly we feel that at a, such a time of great crisis it's a time when it is possible to get the ear of the people it is possible when people are more open to listen to fresh and new ideas and alternatives I think it's up to us as a political organisation to if you like put ourselves in a position to present ourselves as that credible alternative. Uh, I know the late Tahi O'Connell, speaking actually in Bodenstown uh, in 1989, I think, said that the historic role of the Republican movement was to act as a catalyst for the progressive forces within Ireland. We would see ourselves somewhat similar, you know, in, 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 in coalition with people like Shell to Sea, who are fighting for the control of our natural resources, um, the more progressive elements of the trade union movement, uh, the, the many grassroots uh, community organisations and social groups that are out there. I think that kind of critical mass of Irish people is required and certainly the Republican movement and Republican Sinn Féin I think have a key role to play in there. As I say, we're, 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 we're coming with a clear agenda and with a very clearly set out programme for the kind of alternative Ireland that we have. And I think, you know, one thing that I think and one message I think is required for the Irish people at the moment is having confidence in themselves. It's something that I think has been taken from us. You know, even our sense of identity, our sense of pride in our history and so on is something that's been steadily eroded. And Tom McGurk actually recently in the Sunday Business Post made a, I thought, a very cogent point where 
it's often asked why are the people in Greece and the people on the continent more ready to come out and protest and so on and he made the point that you know in 1966 for instance you know the Irish people were encouraged to have pride in 1916 have pride in the, our history of resistance our separate identity over the last 50 years that's been steadily eroded to a point where in many cases we're, we're seen as a kind of a mid-Atlantic kind of non-entity we, we, you know we're, we're, we really don't have a separate identity any longer or that's the perception there's kind of been a, a steady rolling back of you know the, the, the cultural and political advances that were made in the early part of the 20th century in Ireland and consequently we're, we're open to groups like the Trike to come in here and basically throw their political weight about because people don't have that self-confidence that, you know, the, the, the necessary tools to kind of go out there and say, no, you know, this is Ireland, we're, we're, we're prepared to stand up to this. So we're saying that's an essential tool that we need to rearm ourselves with, that, that sense of self-identity. And not in an exclusive way, absolutely not. I mean, you know, we're in Ireland now with diverse cultures and so on, and it's a necessary part of it. <laughs> 